hope that you enjoyed that beautiful garden. Uh, thanks for sharing your garden with us. All right now we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, fruit tree productions in particular. We're going to be talking about the kind of the king of the Central Texas fruit, the peach. And joining me is Jim Comis, who is an assistant professor at the, uh, and also works with the Extension Service out in Fredericksburg. Yes. It's great to have you back with us, Jim. Good to be back, Tom. And uh, you are co-author of a terrific new resource for anybody's interest in this topic, Texas Peach Handbook. Uh, your co-author was Larry Stein. Uh, tell me about uh, your vision for the book. It, it seems to be for both commercial growers and the homeowner. Hey, it sure is. It was a great, great activity to, to, to work with uh, Larry on this project. That uh, Actually, it started, I was asked to review a manuscript by Texas A&M Press on growing peaches, and it really wasn't very good. And so the editor just said, well, then why don't you write a book? And I, <laughs> and I went to Larry and said, Larry, are you in this with me? He said, sure. And uh -huh. so it, it took us a little over a year, but it came out this last May, and mm -hmm. we're real pleased with it. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it is comprehensive. And, for, and this is such a great topic right now because everybody wants to grow uh, food at home now. Sure. It seems like the number one gardening topic. And uh, peaches are, you know, the, kind of the favored fruit of our region, what we are known for. Uh, yet they're not the easiest ones to grow. No, they're a little bit disease sensitive, especially in wet years, if we mm -hmm. remember what a wet year is like. But right. uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and they're, since they're shallow rooted, they are quite susceptible to drought. So they uh, are a little finicky, but they're, they're a great crop to work with. Well, we've chosen this time of year to talk about them because this is an important time for planting as well as for uh, upkeep of, the, of the, the peaches. Let's talk about uh, uh, planting. What should people be looking for in a tree when they're planting? And uh, what's, what's, let's talk about planting technique a little bit. Sure, uh, you can plant containerized trees any times of year, but tr traditionally peach trees are sold from nurseries as bare-rooted trees. Uh, to be honest, really a smaller tree will grow out quicker than a large tree. If you think about it, when they're dug out of the nursery, a smaller tree, you'll lose less of the root system. So you're planting a more intact tree. Mm -hmm. So try not to you know, settle for immediate gratification by buying this big tree. Plant something small and it'll actually grow out quicker than a large uh, nursery I've been, stock. I've been telling people that for years, but you know what? They don't they want to listen to it. No, you're right. <laughs> what, what do you mean, pick the runt? <laughs> no, that, and it's, it's true. I had, a, had an orchard, and really some of the smallest trees grew out quicker than some of the larger ones. True. So. Well, it's, it is true. And uh, in terms of bare root plants, um, you know, there is a, you know, a, a kind of a time window, really, when that's appropriate, don't you think? Sure. Uh, traditionally, nurseries start shipping towards the middle of January, so January, February, up through the middle of March. All of those are good times to uh, receive and plant trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of taking care of them, uh, really the old adage is a dry root is a dead root. So just keep the trees nice and moist, uh, keep them cool, and uh, they'll transplant very well. Yeah. And Really, when you bring them home from the nurseries, you sh you sh I think you should try to get it in the ground as quickly as possible. Absolutely, and if you can't get it in the ground right there, just prepare a healing bed. Just get some sand, lay them on the side, cover them, cover the roots up completely, and keep it moist, and, and they'll hold until you're ready to, uh, to plant them. But as soon as you put them uh, in contact with <coughs> soil, the roots are going to want to start to grow. Yeah, and uh, so uh, be on the lookout for them. They're going to be in the nurseries now. Yes. And then um, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, which varieties? This is the, the, a key thing because you want to get uh, the right varieties for our region. Uh, what are your, your your favorites, and let's talk about uh, why they're your favorites. Sure. Well, the central central Texas region, there's really multiple chilling zones. If you go down towards San Marcos, you're in a 450, 500 hour zone. East side of Austin, you're in a 600, 650. And the further west and the further north you go, the higher the chilling requirement. Uh, and let's let's tell people what, why we're talking about the chilling requirement. This is for folks who aren't used to this language. This is the number of hours in any given winter that you're going to get below what, 45? 45 degrees is yeah. our traditional benchmark. Right. There are growth inhibitors that are in, in peach buds and different varieties have different chilling requirements or mm -hmm. require a different amount of time mm -hmm. to break down these ch uh, these growth inhibitors to allow the trees to bloom and grow normally in the spring. Okay. So if you plant a tree, a 450 hour tree in an 800 hour zone, you're asking for trouble because you're going to have early bud break and your chance of spring frost is going to be much higher. So yeah. uh, you, you really try and match the variety with the chilling zone. Okay. So. 
high uh, chilling hours in the hill country, much less so the further you, you get from there, um, the further east and south you go. The closer you get to the coast, the less chilling you're going to get. Right, obviously. And now, uh, in terms of varieties, let's let's choose, uh, you know, let's, let's a couple for uh, the hill country, maybe some for a little bit uh, warmer areas. A couple of my favorites for the hill country is Harvester, typically ripens around the 1st of June. It's a semi-free stone. Very uh, consistent producer, high quality fruit, uh, relatively disease free, and it's mm -hmm. it's just a, a dependable variety for mm -hmm. for our mid seasons. Harvester, and, yes, okay. harvester, and one of my later season varieties that I really like is Dixieland. Okay, it's rough and tough. It's a freestone peach, uh, crops every year. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it crops in, in low chilling years, high chilling years, so it's another very dependable producer, very high mm -hmm. quality okay. fruit. Okay, harvester and Dixieland for the hill, hill country. country. And then for the the lowlands, the lower areas, uh, one is dependable. It is it's an older variety. It's called June Gold. It's about yeah, a 650 it's been already. Forever. Oh yeah, and it, it, it's it's very dependable. It's it tends to have a split pit at the seed, which is the only detraction from it. But for a homeowner, there's nothing wrong with that. For mm -hmm. commercial commercial variety, there are some newer ones that are maybe a little better choice. But mm -hmm. uh, but June Gold is, is is one of my favorites in the 650 zone. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go a little further south from that uh, into the 450 hour zone. Florida King is probably the best choice. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dependable pr producer out of University of Florida, and it's a 450-hour chiller. June Gold and Florida King. Correct. Okay, those are okay. some great variety names here. People can be on the lookout for those, and I know that those are available. I've seen them in the yes. nurseries, so th that's terrific. Now, um, one of the things I really, really love about the book because I'm tired of trying to explain this on the radio. I can now tell people, just go look at Jen's book. You know, uh, proper pruning for peaches, because, uh, you, you know, especially in commercial production, this is really important because you want a heavy fruit bear. On, yes. On, and then that's, but you also a need a weight. sound tree. Right, right. So, and this is the time again, midwinter into ge uh, January and February is when you do the pruning. What's the appropriate thing? Well, the, I think the most important thing to understand about pruning is pruning is a combination of both the art and the science of horticulture mm -hmm. that you're, 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 you're creating something like a, a sculptor's creating uh, an object out of a stone. Well, you've got a tree there that's kind of your rough, your rough media and you're trying to visualize an open center tree. And if you take a look at some of the photos, you can see that it's simply, you know, you have a trunk uh, 15 to 18 inches tall and you have three or four scaffold limbs that open that tree up and you're, you're trying to create an, an open bowl, a martini glass, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, every tree is different, so there are none that really look like the ones in the textbook, mm -hmm. but it, it gives you a conception of, of how the tree should look, and, and mm -hmm. the book really explains why that is. And yeah. that's, that's one of my favorite things about the book, is we go into more the whys rather than just the hows. Right, well, and, and I think that's gonna be really valuable for a lot of us, and, and, and again, we've used a little bit of a technical phrase, there's a scaffolding branch, which are those strong horizontal branches that can bear the weight of the fruit when it's Yes, mature. they're the permanent structures of the tree, and right. from that we're growing wood and fruit. Right, right. And, uh, you know, there, I have to say, there's nothing more beautiful than the sight, I think, of a well-pruned peach tree in bloom. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, the, 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 there, there's an art to it, as you indicated. And so these are not only are they great for food production, and there's something of real value there that everybody can enjoy, but they're aesthetically, they're, they're, they're knockouts, really. That's why we're in this business. That's why we love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, and what's your favorite time to prune, let me ask? Well, it, dep it depends on how many trees you have. Mm -hmm. I personally like to, to prune trees when they're <clears throat> just starting to push blooms mm -hmm. uh, because it gives you, number one, trees are less uh, sensitive to infection from bacterial and fungal mm -hmm. uh, pathogens. Uh, but also, it, 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 the, the sooner a tree is, is pruned, the quicker it'll bloom. So if you can hold off that temptation to prune a tree, you'll actually delay bloom a little bit, giving it a little extra uh, guard against spring frost. Okay. But again, that depends on how many makes, trees you have. Makes, you, makes sense. Yeah, it depends on the, the, there's a practicality question involved Absolutely. in this, right? Sometimes you need to get after it. Now, uh, in, in terms of fertilizing the plants, uh, what's your favorite kind of blend of fertilizer for, uh, 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 let's say, new trees and then established trees? Well, the, the nutrient we need most is nitrogen. Mm -hmm. in, in the hill country, we have plenty of phosphorus, generally plenty of potassium. So uh, nitrogen and micronutrients. Uh, so, uh, you know, any kind of, of, of a blend that, that's heavy on the nitrogen and actually very low on the phosphorus. In our high pH soils, the addition of phosphorus is going to exacerbate iron and zinc deficiencies. So we, tr so we try and lay off of that. But I think one of the new thinkings we have about fertilizers, 
we really don't think you need to have it in place before bloom anymore. The nitrogen those trees use very early on in the season is all stored nitrogen from the previous season. Mm -hmm. So that allows you to wait until after you see what kind of a crop you have set before you really need to add nitrogen or any kind of fertilizer and you, and you can adjust the amount based on what kind of a crop you have. Okay, okay, that makes sense and that's very interesting new information to me and to my ears certainly. Now, uh, winter time is also a time to do some preventative spraying because peaches are uh, somewhat uh, pest prone. Yes. And uh, this is a good time of year to get it kind of keep your eyes out or actually apply uh, uh, different kinds of pesticides to control that. The, uh, the, the product that's tr traditionally uh, applied in the winter is dormant oil. Mm -hmm. and dormant oil is good for a couple of things. It controls uh, scale insects which are really they're ubiquitous, but they're also very, they're somewhat hidden pests. You don't really notice them right. until they're a problem. Right. So annual applications of dormant oil uh, will prevent that. That mm -hmm. also is really good at, at knocking down mite populations too. Okay, and then real briefly, let's talk about Curculio, but we only have a few seconds to do so. Sure. Plum Curculio. Plum Curculio is, is kind of the, the traditional uh, proverbial worm in the peach. Uh, and it doesn't really matter whether you're spraying conventional insecticides or organic insecticides. The key to controlling curculio is timing. If you spray right at the end of petal fall toward chuck split, about a week after petal fall, that's typically you will pick up cur curculio there. Okay, and there are lots of good old organic alternatives yes, for that, so people can be on the lookout for those. Well, again, it's the Texas Peach Handbook, Texas A&M University Press. Yes. Your co-author is Larry Steiner, and or Stein, and uh, we. I, Jim, this is just terrific. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing Thanks, all this I great information. It as well. I know the, a lot of folks out there are going to start those backyard orchards after Good. getting this. Good. Uh, we're here. All right. Well, thank you. And coming up next is our friend Daphne.